This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. The following podcast may contain swearing, some sexual references and a huge amount of sexual tension. If you're easily offended by these, please don't listen. Welcome to Grilled. I want to eat Sunday roast whenever I want to eat Sunday roast, not when you want me to eat it. I'm cooking burgers. Oh, burgers! <laughs> I hope they're not McDonald's. And you would bend down to pick it up and then he'd fart in your face. He thought that was very, very funny. Don't mind a bit of gangster rap if I'm driving around talking, giving it some, you know. Strike. The guy said to me, the waiter, do you want to come and see the kitchen? I said, no, not really, mate. I've seen one kitchen, I've seen them all. Like a piece of your culinary penis in or around their mouth. Welcome to Grilled by the Staff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of the Staff Canteen. <laughs> and for the next six episodes, I'll have a co-host. Michael O'Hare, welcome to Grilled. Hello and thank you for having me. Well, I'm very, Absolute very excited. Pleasure. Six episodes, it's a nice amount that, isn't it? I think it's just enough, I think, for everyone. Some, you know, some real truths about each other, some real like heartfelt truths. And now I feel like we're really going to get to know each other, which is a, a terrifying and exciting prospect. <laughs> um, but it's not just you, we are also going to have a guest each time, so they don't just have to listen to me and you blathering on for six episodes we do have some exciting people coming up so let's introduce our first guest um i'd say he's one of the most uh, the uk's most exciting chefs and if you get the chance to go to his restaurant it is i've just said this to michael the best club stroke meal you'll ever ever have and go to uh, because you put as much into your playlist as you do your amazing food um, and he's also one of the nicest chefs in the industry and um, so um michael before um i introduce him why did you want to add him to our podcast guest list because i wanted to add gareth to our podcast guest list not just because he's one of my closest friends um but Gareth, I think, for someone that has, you know, such a big profile and a lot of chefs um, are very aware of him, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable here, Gareth. But um, <laughs> I feel, and I said to Cara, that the term legend gets thrown around left, right and centre with everyone. It's almost like saying, hello, mate, I, he's a legend, whatever. But with Gareth, I think the term legend can be used because other people within the industry have to change because you exist. Oh, wow. I see that in, in other people's food, and I see it in people with three Michelin stars that are dying, dying to get like a piece of your culinary penis in or around their mouth. Oh, yeah, I'd love to that. That's me. <laughs> I'd like my culinary penis all over a three star chef's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is a hell of an intro. Uh, Gareth Ward, welcome to Grilled. How are you doing? You all right? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I'm a bit flat. I might start crying in a minute, Michael. Oh, that's beautiful. Just call it hair fever, mate, and we'll uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just blame it on COVID, it'll be fine. Cara, can I get the party started with my intro question? Yes, you go for it with your intro I'm nervous question. nervous she is. <laughs> so, Gareth, um, yeah. my intro question, you've got to think about it carefully. Um, and you're not allowed to say me, okay? Right, okay. Just, I want two, just two, not the favourite, but two of your favourite chefs in the UK at the moment. Alex Bond and Tony Parkin. Alex Bond and Tony Parkin, thank you. Yeah. Alex Bond and Tony Parkin, you have to shag one of them. Wait, whichever one you don't shag dies. Oh, chef, you can't ask that one. (laughs) 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 Okay. You're shagging Alex or Tony? Can I drill a hole through one and get the other one at the same time? No, way? there's no way out of this. One of them has to come, the other one has to die. Oh, my God. That's really hard. Uh, Gareth, you know, life's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. I'm going to have to say Alex. I'm going to shag. Yeah. Because I've known him longer than Tony. What, so you think it would mean more? Um, he's, he's, yeah. And I'm going to say this, Alex is a dirty bastard. You'd have some great sex with Alex. Some of the stories Alex has told me about his sexual, on his own, is not with anybody else. Oh, Only really? Yeah. You're going to have a fucking great night with that guy. Socks had eyes. Oh, mate, I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> not just socks I've heard about. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's escalating so quickly for 11 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fucking great question. I reckon we could go out on that one. <laughs> That would go, vi- that'd go viral. Uh. 
thanks for listening, everybody. This has been yeah, that's it. <laughs> 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 Right, as I've got you both, um, I think, would you be able to tell me a little bit about how you know each other and your favourite story about each other? I mean, I feel like we touched on this before we started recording when we talked about the Jaeger, but I feel like you've probably got even more than that. So, Michael, how do you know Gaz and, and what's your best story about Gaz? <laughs> um, do you know what? I'm not really sure how we met. That sounds really like... I remember I the first remember, like, time we ever spoke to each other. Yeah. That was at the year awards afterwards. Ah, yeah, yeah. And we were like two, like, it's like we were two... Teenage, like teenagers, like that, fancied each other a little bit, and we were like, yeah. we, kind of shuffled, we kind of shuffled over, like closer and closer and closer, and like, I'm, I'll, I'll ask, like, go, on, go on, talk to him, go on, like, go on, talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just like, you're right, and you're like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was, and and we became friends, and it's um, I don't know. It's you said to me, you said to me, your words to me were, I want to go to Morzine and spend loads of money and get absolutely fucked and do loads of skiing and then cook for some people. I was like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I invited Gareth to, um, to Morzine, which it was your birthday celebrations for a couple of years, Cara. It was. Uh, I missed <laughs> out this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and it kind of went from there. And I think this is like probably my favourite story with Gareth because I think that um, I'm not really a big drinker, genuinely. Like, I don't... Um, I don't really drink at home. I seldom go on nights out or anything like that. Um, and I genuinely live like a pretty pious existence in normal <coughs> peace time, you know? Um, and then when Gareth came over to, to Morzine and he was like, chef, are we getting on it, chef? Are we getting on it? And we just started drinking. And I think it got to the point where there was no amount of alcohol could do anything wrong to us. And we, we were just ordering Jägermeisters by the bottle each. Um, and we did three, right? Yeah. Three bottles yeah. a year ago, we sacked off any mixers. And yeah, the um, mixers were gone. You could just see people around us, like, lagging and dying and, like, making their way home or, you know, having heart attacks. Um, <laughs> and uh, was, Amelia was pregnant, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, she was pregnant, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was being the responsible, like, husband, like, looking after her, like, drinking two and a half bottles a year my state. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're in, this, we're in this French nightclub called Café Opera. Oh, um, well, this. Yeah, a real, real <laughs> sticky floor. Just getting absolutely on it and dancing a terrible, terrible Euro pop. Yeah, clothes were um, coming off and everything, weren't they? Yeah. Oh, and then um, hot tubs afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. You fell asleep in the hot tub. It was amazing. Yeah, I had like the best now hot tubs nap. And then I woke up and I was fresh. I was like, yeah, fucking, where's the drinks? And I woke up like I must have fell asleep halfway through. The <laughs> woke up, the conversation had been completely changed. It was just like, there was no awkwardness. It was nothing. <laughs> it's a really comfortable environment. Yeah, I was just like, all right, guys, how's it going? It was, you know, like, um, I don't know if, if you guys like Formula One, but I used to, when I was a kid, I used to really like Formula One to, like, start watching it, have my Sunday lunch, and then I've eaten that much that it knocks me out. <laughs> by the time I wake up, like, it's the last couple of laps. Yeah, it's the best bit. And it, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the best way to watch like Formula yeah, One. You've seen the best bit at the beginning, and then the best bit at the end. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, like, Sunday lunch and Formula One goes so well together. And yeah, I think, like, yeah, snowboard and all, like, Morzine and hot tubs work so nicely for the same reason. You drink that much that you knock yourself out. Yeah. But then a hot tub gives you a nice little, like, chill. And then you back into it for the best <laughs> bit. Like, all oh, right, okay, I'm still the last man standing. We were in that, we were in that hot tub for about 10 hours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gareth, what about you? What's your favourite story of, of Michael? My favourite story of Michael, fucking hell. Oh. I've just there's, there's, that's there's, the only memory we've got, Karen. Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, to, <laughs> struggling to remember. We don't even really know each other. That's the only thing that's ever happened. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. It's all right. It's all right. I'll just go on the list with Tony, people that you want to kill. <laughs> no way. That's not true. I mean, because my favourite memory is the Jägermeister memory, obviously. Well, you can both have the same oh, hang memory. Hang on. I tell you what. I'll, I'll, give, um, I'll give you... You can have the Jägermeister memory, Gareth. Yeah. And I'll, I'll have the one where Gareth didn't want to ski, didn't want to snowboard. Yeah. So, <laughs> so he, um, he got on a, a ski lift, but like a chairlift, to go and meet us for a drink at lunchtime, which is like, what, a 1,200-metre ascent. 
to the top of Vorios. Um, and he managed to get, without any skis or a snowboard, to the second lift up. Yeah, I did. And uh, then the PCA was like going nuts at him, saying like, you can't come up here. As I got on and everything. He pressed a massive red button and stopped <laughs> like, thousands of people looking at me. <laughs> like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? But all in French. And Gareth's yeah. like, I don't, I don't know. And uh, <laughs> he's like, you can't be here. He's like, well, I'm here now. Um, yeah. It's like, well, you, you got to go back down. And, and Gaz had the option of like walking back down a mountain or climbing twice as far up it. Um, and yeah, commitment to the cause, he hiked up it, <laughs> met us there for lunch, walked up a mountain yeah. in January. Walked up a mountain just to get a fucking few rums down my neck. And, and a roast chicken. And a spit roast chicken with chips, which was amazing. Yeah. It was fucking class. Ketchup, mustard and mayonnaise. Yeah, that was a good walk, that was. No, um, skiing and snowboarding wasn't for you, was it, Gaz? No, um, too top heavy, I think. <laughs> my, mate, my mate Dave's snowboard instructor was Gareth's snowboard instructor, and he's a Geordie as well. And um, he said to me, he's like, teaching Gareth Ward to snowboard is like trying to teach the fucking Empire State building to snowboard. <laughs> he tells you in advance when he's about to fall over, and you can just wait and watch it. <laughs> Look at your watch, it's like slow motion as gas goes down. <laughs> It was hilarious. I was, like, mate, I was like, mate, would you judge me if I just fucked this off and went for a pint? And he's like, no, no. I said, right, I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> Fully deuces over there. I can hear it. I'm fucking off. <laughs> um, Michael, you've got a few questions uh, for Gaz. So, do you want to do you want to start with your uh, micro influencers and how they have kind of changed the food scene over the past twelve months? Yeah, so, guys, um, this is quite a complex question that kind of just involved me putting my opinion on you. Um, <laughs> but, Great. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the, the context of it. Um, either last weekend or the weekend before, I can't really remember, I woke up and there's an enormous queue over the road from my house. Um, this queue went on for genuinely one mile. No way. And it was a queue for a pop-up um, selling donuts and brownies. Wow. And um, I had no idea about it. And it kind of shocked me a little bit. And it made me feel a little bit insecure and unsafe. And um, the reason being, I thought, like, I'm not <clears throat> saying I'm an authority on food, but, you know, as far as leads go, I'm one of the most kind of known, if you like, or um, I have the most knowledge on food or authority. Yeah. Yeah. And then this thing had, like, kind of come from underneath me. You thought someone might have gone, hey, chef, by the way, I'm outside your front door if you want a brownie. Yeah, they don't know me, mate. They don't give a shit. Like, and I felt like I looked into it, and uh, apparently, it's like it was like kind of an influencer, like um, you know, a fair play to her. Um, was a makeup artist that started baking during lockdown, put videos up, and then it became like a big thing. And then she's got queue for a mile outside my front door, and I thought that is that is mental. Now bakers have to have a profile because, yeah. like, if you want to open a cake shop, you have to compete with that. Um. <laughs> And it, it really like flummoxed me for a whole day. And it's nothing, you know, I mean, no negativity towards the, the lady that was doing it or anything like that. It was just for me, it was a bit of a wake up call because I shied away from or tried to shy away from being full of shit with social, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and egging it on and trying. I think if you have to try and sell something, then it's not worth buying. And this isn't about the brownie thing. But in terms of like generating a buzz, I just thought I'd rather just be real and just it is what it is, you know, because social media exists, whether you like it or not, you're in a competition. Yeah, completely. If you, um, if you stop using social media, Inesia will probably fail. Would you say that's a fair thing to say? Yeah, I hate social media, but it yeah. is the biggest tool we have. So my, my question is how much pressure, because you're not what I would call like an Instagram slut, are you? You're not constantly, no. you know what I mean? It's very much just your life that that's I see. My, that's my other profile you haven't seen yet. <laughs> that's your only fan. <laughs> um, Me and Alex. So so I, I, my question is that with this, with this kind of new pressure that, yeah, I mean, we're still currently just in our 30s, but I feel old. Like when I see this happen, I think, shit, like things are moving fast. How do you personally cope with um, the pressure or the knowledge that you've got to do certain things like that? Yeah, that it's crazy, isn't it? You want to do. It's like, it's like, Cara, remember this? I was up for <laughs> social inf influence, influencer, wasn't I? Yeah. I was one of the, the four or five 
top runners up or whatever. And, and this bird, right, who I've never even heard of, she'd been around for five minutes and she had about three million fucking followers. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's you. the lovely Poppy O'Toole. Yeah, she. Uh, Poppy O'Toole. Yeah. Right, and I'm there, like I'm there, thinking, you know what, like this is, it's all right, it's nice to be seen. I, I could win this. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I've got a decent amount of followers on Instagram. People know who I am. And then this fucking tool turns up from fucking nowhere <laughs> with a, with ten billion followers, and like in a week, she's done that in a week or something. You know what I mean? By what? I don't even know what she did. What'd you do? I think it's longer than a week. She, well, what, <laughs> just let me put this into a bit of context. Her backstory is that she is a chef, but she lost her job because of COVID. So she started doing cooking videos on TikTok and it just went mad. And it's very similar to what Michael's just said. You know, people yeah. people want to, they want to see that. And that if you've got a profile, they're, they're, they're interested in that, aren't they? So yeah, it, it literally escalated from her losing her job to now where she's got yeah. millions of followers but she does battle constantly on instagram with people saying she's not a real chef because she oh, does really? it on social media yeah. so well, i think it's, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite important to it? point that out that you know uh, what you're saying is right but she is she's a trained chef she's the power of, the power of like i mean this tiktok thing i mean like my kids are on it and stuff like that and i, I think it's disgusting to be honest but um yeah what, what you're saying is the power of social media is unbelievable and like you've got to be so careful of what you do on there, so so careful because it can make you or break you, you know. So like, it, there is a pressure to keep your business on there. Like obviously, it is our it, anybody who doesn't advertise their business on social media is an idiot because yeah, it's yeah. free, you know. Like PR, like we used to have PR, right? And whatever anybody's opinion on PR is, in my opinion, and I hate to say this, and I'm going to offend a few people, you don't really need PR anymore. It's a waste of money. Because you've got social media and it's free. Mm -hmm. That's your biggest PR tool ever. You know, if someone wants to see you, you put someone on there. You know, there's thousands and thousands of people who can see what you're doing. Like, it's straight to their fucking phone, which they've got in their hand glued to their PS 24-7. You know what I mean? There's no closer contact than that. You know, it's like, is it? It's a, but it's, it's also scary, isn't it? Like, it's so fucking scary, social media. Well, I, I think, you know, going back to the kind of, and um, I mean no disrespect to her, the, the Poppy O'Toole thing, is it is it that um, the food becomes kind of akin to music? Yeah. Well, no, to music. And I, I think for years, like, you just think that food was food and good food is good food. And if you like good food, you like all good food. But the reality is that there's, there's an audience for everyone. And yeah. although you'll get, like, kind of shared tastes, like... My dad will listen a little bit to the Rolling Stones, but a lot more to Motown. Yeah. Um, whereas, like, my mum listened to, like, Michael Bolton, you know what I mean? Or, like, Celine Dion or something like that, which is, like, in my opinion, well, Bolton's all right, class haircut, but Celine Dion, like, is just uber pop. It, you know, it knocks me bad. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not music. It doesn't mean that people don't like it. It just means that it's way, way more popular and I don't think, you know, a band like the Rolling Stones couldn't exist today if they weren't already the Rolling Stones. No. Because you've got, like, I don't, I'm not up to date with music at all. I don't listen to anything really past 1976. <laughs> but, like, um, but you know what I mean? The kind of break from the world and things like that is just uber, uber popular. Yeah. And it's a different clientele, a different audience. And there's not one person that was in that one mile queue outside my house that I felt was either a guest or a potential guest for the man behind the curtain. I didn't feel like there was any thought of like, oh, you've got my clients. Do you know what I mean? I didn't feel like that. And it's the same with like in a seer. And although you and I, I know have like a shared client base to a degree, there'll be some people that go to your restaurant that fucking hate mine. And some people that go to mine that fucking hate yours. Yeah. Um, although I'm yet to hear anyone say like a bad word about your restaurant. Just, it was an example. Um, for me, it's like food has become, because it's so accessible and you can buy something, it's tangible. That brownie, that's the new Beatles CD. <laughs> you can't buy a Beatles album, uh, record, sorry. You can't buy a Beatles record anymore that's new. No. So it's the 60s, but that was like, it was Beatlemania over a brownie. I thought, whoa, fuck. Beatlemania over a brownie. <laughs> yeah, food, food is going in a direction that, um, that potentially, if you wanted to, you could piggyback and make a great deal of money from. Yeah. hundred percent because, you know, technical ability and profile already exists. Therefore you could jump on that 
And um, I mean, those people have been true to what, you know, the Brownie girl being true, Poppy O'Toole has been true to what she's doing. Yeah. Um, that's what they want to do. And we're doing what we want to do. It's just not as populist mm. or not as popular. Um, and there's an opportunity. And I saw that. And you know what it's like with kind of pandemic. You're thinking, you know, is there another avenue that I could get some passive income? Yeah. How do, do I want to ride that wave? <laughs> or because once you're on, once like, you're, you're getting off. Yeah, exactly. In fact, the restaurant and everything, you'll be selling fucking brownies out the back of your house. I mean, <laughs> 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 do, do, do you feel like um, that that's something that, that, you know, that you have to do that is um, integrity in business? It's definitely something that you, you, exactly like what you've said, you look at it and think, fuck, look at that. Like, there's potential there. Mm. It does cross your mind, doesn't it? And you're like thinking, you know, like, yeah, you, it, it's, it is what it is. Like, you either get on it or you don't. You've got to stay true to yourself, haven't you? It is, it is, but it is very, very scary to watch it. You know, a few people like that that have come up out of nowhere and they're just like selling something not average, but something very bog standard, and it's like gone crazy. And you're thinking, "Fuck!" I thought it was interesting, Michael, that you said about people have gone um, lower end rather than higher end through lockdown. You get what you pay for, right? Yeah. So, like, people can really afford 10, 15 pound things. Hmm. Whereas if you start pushing the two, three hundred pound mark, yeah, you know, th- there's not. Um, I haven't seen a fine dining restaurant in the country that's starting to shift, you know, bottles of Petrus out the cellar, no. on, like <laughs> on delivery. <laughs> and um, and I, I don't think that's entirely down to, um, a, you know, an, an imminent recession. There's also a feeling of like you want, well, you want them things in the restaurant, don't you? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, you want to be sat in a rest like when when our dodgy bloke who runs fucking wheels took us down to like we could open we could open our restaurant and we could open from till six o'clock at night but you can't serve anybody any alcohol everyone's just like well why the fuck would i want to come to a restaurant you know what i mean <laughs> like i want to fucking drink i want to i want to buy that bottle of petrus you know what i mean like it's like people will buy that when they're here when they've got somebody who they think, I mean, it doesn't matter if they do or not, knows what the wine is all about and how to open it and how to serve it to you and all the rest of it because they're paying for that service, aren't they? Yeah. You don't want to open a bottle of Petrus in there with that dodgy fucking bird bottle opener in their house that might snap the cork or whatever. And then <laughs> the Alessi uh, one. Drink it out of a fucking mug like our last does, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> is, it, is Amelia wine out the mug? No, yeah, like, our, our last loves it. Our last drink wine out of anything. She can give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> With um, with the restaurant guys, yeah. Obviously, like you are an enormous part of that restaurant, and yeah. it's it's very much dependent. I mean, you know, your name's on it; it's next to it. Um, how do you how do you personally find a balance with you know you've got your kids, your family, um, <clears throat> and your personal like me time and happiness? Like, how do you find? I know that you get a lot of happiness from work. Yeah. Um, how do you find that? that balance of happiness and do you feel any pressures within the fact that it's almost inevitable that you need to be at the restaurant? Yeah. I mean, I'll always be here regardless like services. I'm here for service every day. Well, I'm here all day, every day anyway. Uh, it is a pressure. Obviously when I first started here, it was a seven day operation because it was a hotel and that was really fucking hard because you wanted to be here seven days a week, which you were. And like, obviously Carl wasn't here then, but he is now, but I've got two kids who live in Scotland, which is like a just a nightmare. You know, <laughs> it's like, so it's, but like we've taken the restaurant down to four days a week now, which has given us that three days where we, we can go and do stuff. And it, it is hard to like, to make your life work, but you've, you've just got to do it, haven't you? You know, but like the quality of life now and what we've got here in Wales is like the best it's probably ever going to be, you know, unless like a win stinking amount of money and just do one service in a week, which is a dream. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, I know a lot of people will, will use the term family to describe the people that they work with. Yeah. But from the times that I've been at Inesir, and that's included um, times when you haven't been open, I've, I've never sensed such a strong sense of community. Yeah. Um, it's almost Great. like, yeah. well, it's like the Lost Boys. Like, you're their Peter Pan, aren't you? Yeah, and, a- <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, but it is. You've got like a tree house out the back with a massive barbecue in it, and it's yeah. It's, it, for me, it was full Peter Pan, and I mean that as the biggest compliment ever because I think it's it's such a difficult thing to to one find people that you can get on with. Yeah, 
that you can have common ground and that you can you can talk on the same you know operate on the same frequency as yeah. but then to have that over a group that seem to genuinely love and care for each other yeah uh, when no. i've been there nothing's been a hassle at all and they've almost like it's somewhere in between my grandma only not dead um <laughs> and and the lost boy is only real you know yeah. what i mean <laughs> Like the, there's a real kind of hospitality and family to it that I think is um, is stronger than anywhere I've ever seen. How do you how do you achieve that, or is it yes. like an organic thing? So when we obviously you have fucking been here, like people say it's in the middle of nowhere. It's not. It's like the end of fucking nowhere. You know what I mean? So to make that commitment as a as a chef, a young chef, to move away from say Leeds or where you can do anything anytime you want, or Liverpool or Liverpool or Manchester or London, you know where you've got a life and move here. I mean, it's fucking stunning. You'll not live anywhere more beautiful. But there's fuck all to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> Apart from cook and walk. If you want, if you're keen at walking, but which which twenty odd year old wants to go for a walk? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. So it's like it's a huge commitment. So you, we get people here, and our selection process is: you come and work with us for a week. Yeah. And I don't give a fuck what you've done, where you've worked, how good a chef you are. I don't care how good. A, if you've got three Michelin stars, I don't care. It's if I get on with you, if I want you, because you're coming into this, like our philosophy here is it's an inner sea of family. It is a family, you know, and if you don't like your family, you don't see them there. You just don't want, you just forget about them. See them at Christmas time and then say, oh yeah, I miss you, I read over you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll see you next year. You know what I mean? Like, that's what it's like. So I want people around me that I trust with Carl or my family or, or Amelia, you know, like who's going to look after my friends like when you come over, like I would, like members of the family. You want to you want to be able to get on with these people. You're spending 16 hours a day with each other. You know they all live in the same house. You know, like everyone is sort of around each other 24 seven. So it's got to be like that's the selection process. Like I can teach you how to cook our food. You know, I don't care what you already know. Yeah, if you've got some great knowledge, that's amazing. It's going to like push the restaurant forward, and you might be able to tell us something that we've never just seen before, or done before, and that's amazing. Like we're all wanting to learn. But first and foremost, it's it's like, are you going to fit in? Are you an asshole? Yes. Okay. Well, go and go and find a job somewhere else. You know, like leave your attitudes at the door. That's kind of our thing. Like, I don't give a fuck who you are. You take your attitude off and you leave it at the front door. And when you go at home at nighttime, pick it back up and take it home. You can be wherever you want to be there, but you're not that here. You know. And there's no like, there's no aggression. There's no shouting. There's no screaming. There's just like, if someone fucks up, they fuck up. It 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 happens. You know. I make huge mistakes <clears throat> you've just got to get on with it like we'll talk about it after if it's worth it um if it's not we'll forget about it and move on you know like there's no point standing standing around shouting and screaming at each other or calling someone a cunt or fucking belittling them in front of somebody or making them feel like shit doesn't do anything for anybody no, no i agree with that creates chaos it creates nervousness and people being scared which means they won't do their job properly like you've said there like my boys love being here, so they give me 100% every time because they want to. It's not because they've been scared and been made to. It's because they want to, you know what I mean? So I trust them all 100% because I know that they're going to do their job to their best ability because they want to do, they want to work here. They've made that commitment. You know, they're part of the family. And like, yeah, we do, we do. Like I've bought two goalposts and a load of footballs and some football gloves and stuff over lockdown. They made a football pitch in the, in the garden. So all the boys, are, we've still got a team. We're still doing some of those teams. You know what I mean? Keeping that teamwork going, keeping that family thing going. We'll, we'll play football like three, four times a week, you know, and it'll be like wrote down in everyone's notebooks, like half past two football for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's just like, that's the way it's got to be, isn't it? And like, you, you want to like, you want to go into battle with these people. It's 300, isn't it? Like you want to go into battle with your 300 soldiers and doesn't give a fuck. They've got 10 million soldiers. I don't give a fuck. My 3 million are going to kick your fucking face in. So <laughs> 300 are going to all over it. And that's what you want. You want them people on, on your side, don't you? And you trust every single one of them. Yeah, 100%. And it's something that, you know, I, I'm not just saying it at the moment. I feel like I've got that the best I've ever had it. Yeah, me too. It's not it's not perfect. It's not anywhere near on your level, if I'm honest. Um, but, I mean, you know some of my boys. You've known them for years. Yeah. What I'm I'm trying to encourage as much as I can is an openness of conversation. And that's like, unless anyone else has got exactly the same name as me, 
then there's no sense in you being there forever. Yeah, exactly. It means that you've, you've got to have a plan. Also, <clears throat> I'm is good. not really going to change style. I'm not really going to change the menu too much. Do you know no. what I mean? So if you wait, if you stay here six years, you've probably wasted four. Yeah. Um. So there should be a conversation for everyone's happiness in like realizing what they want to do. Like each one of my, my boys and girls must have a plan or an idea of where they want to be in five, 10 years time, be that owning a bakery, owning a wine bar, owning a coffee shop, owning a fine dining restaurant, whatever it is. Yeah. And I feel like I've genuinely missed out on those conversations. And it's such an interesting conversation to have. Um, and I'm having it with one guy at the moment. So we can kind of like between us, like bat out where he's going to be. And it also means that when that day comes, um, which I'm bringing it back around to, the, to the, uh, the setup you've got, that you can have a really open conversation about yeah. what you're leaving. And that help as well, like you helping him to find a job. Yeah, 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 exactly. I, I do that with every single one of my chefs. I'll say, where do you want to work, mate? Well, as soon as he said, I want to hand me notes. Where do you want do to you work? Do you two both feel like you had that? No, at no. At that point in your careers? No, no I feel like... Uh, for me personally, and I don't know whether this is to do with my personality, but every time I've handed notice in, for the most part, it's been fueled by spite and anger. Yeah. And it's like, right, that's it, I want to leave. And that's, you know, there's a lot of immaturity. I to leave from the day you got there, but you, you know what I mean? Every day is like... Yeah, exactly. So at <laughs> some point, you know, you know what you want to do, where you want to go next. Um, and just an example I'll give that really kind of brought it to light to me is I had a guy quit at midnight... <laughs> during lockdown, like I think a month ago, something like that, at midnight, emailed. Yeah. Emailed, then removed himself from the group, emailed, quit with immediate effect. Like two weeks before payday or something like that. And he'd worked for me for nearly four years. Yeah. And we hadn't fallen out because we hadn't even been at work. And I thought, <laughs> like, <laughs> That's impressive, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought, I, you know, that he wasn't, in honesty, he wasn't very good. And he worked for me because he had a loyalty and I appreciated that. But at the level that he was at, he wouldn't last five minutes in any of the kitchen. He was very much like Molly Coddled, you know? Yeah. And um, I just thought, at what stage are we at? Whereas people, we're spending so much time with each other. And a lot of talk is happening at the moment about, you know, mental health and things like that within yeah. chefs. But that always seems to be a conversation that when it's at the absolute end degree of like, I'm mentally ill, I need to have a conversation, I need to speak to someone. Yeah. But what doesn't happen is an open conversation about how you feel every single day. You know what I mean? And that's not like a plus or a minus. Sometimes it's just floating in the middle yeah. of like, you know what? I'm thinking of opening a fucking health cafe. Oh, really? Nice one. Tell me about it. Yeah. I'd love to know about this. <laughs> and um, There's a, a phobia or a fear that I feel I haven't generated that it exists within young chefs and people within the industry that they can't really voice. Um, and it's not an open conversation yeah. about what happens next and what's the, what's the end goal. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Isn't it? Cause I was like, like I said before, I didn't finish off. It was like, I'll say it to them. Where do you want to work? Like you tell me where you want to work. And they're like, Oh, I want to go to mid some house chef. I'm like, right. Okay. I'll call Daniel. You know, and I'll say, I've got a guy here who wants to come work for you. Do you want, are you interested? Have you got any positions? Do you want them to send her over? You know, like, and it's like having that like thing, like that's the way it should be, you know? Yeah, should, yeah. Like, where, where's your dream job? You tell me because I'm not being I'm not being arrogant or anything, but I can help you get that job. The other part of that is you've almost got no choice of just because that's the normal way to do it. Yeah. yeah. But if, if someone doesn't approach you like that and applies to Daniel Clifford for a job, yeah, he's going to call you. Of course he is, yeah. So it's it's happening whether you instigate it or not. But I, I think it would be a really po real nice positive change within the industry if everyone could have a conversation often yeah. about where they'd like to be and what they'd like to do. And then there's not the guilt of like, you know, when I, I put if I pull up to my restaurant in a fancy car, I don't have the guilt of saying, Oh well, he's only on twenty grand a year or whatever. Yeah. Because that's not my fault. I was on twenty grand a year when I was that Age, and this yeah. is what I wanted to do, and I committed to doing it. But for as long as you're not voicing the opinion or having the ideas about what you're going to do, and you know, not everyone has to be like top chef or anything. You open a food truck or whatever. As Cara yeah. loves. Yeah. <laughs> I love the food I was going to ask you what car you were pulling up uh, to the restaurant in when you were on twenty grand a year, Michael. <laughs> um, when I was doing, oh my god, right. <laughs> so I had, um, I've got quite an embarrassing back catalogue of cars actually. Oh, yeah. 
And when I was on like 20 grand a year, I had a Mazda MX-5. It's like, why would anyone buy that? Terrible, yeah. terrible car. Yeah, but I had the like an old one. It wasn't even like a new one. Really shit one. <laughs> and what's worse, guys, it's really <laughs> embarrassing, is I bought it because my mum got one and I oh, really no. liked it. So I thought I'd get one as well. So you had a matching car with your mum? I had a matching car with my mum. The only difference is that mine had a tan leather interior and hers had a white leather interior and they were both <laughs> Unos Roost roasters, <laughs> both black. It was so, so like, I don't know. Like, I was single for a lot of years, you know that. And, <laughs> so <laughs> left that much. and I'm making up for it. Like, in, in, <laughs> I'm making up for it now. Yeah, but do you know what I mean? Like, you do these things and everyone has regrets, right? Yeah. I've got, I've got more within my restaurant than I've got within cars. I know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about um, what about the future, guys? Where does, um, what's like, out of 100, 100 being absolutely perfect. Yeah. And zero being hell on earth. Right. Like, what kind of number, in terms of where you see your life going, are you at at the moment? Have you got... Um, the, the friends you want, the business you want, the money that you want, the creativity that you want, the, are you doing what you want to do? You know what I mean? Are you doing it with the people that you want to do? It? Where are you at? And what does the future look like for you? What would you like to happen for it to be better? I'd say I was 70% there. And what, what would you like to change? I, want, uh, uh, I wanted a holiday home in Ibiza. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fucking move there one day. Oh, really? Is that the retirement plan? I just want to go to Ibiza the whole time. <laughs> I want to be on that guest list, guys. It's Ibiza or Morzine. It's there's two places I want to be. Like, <laughs> I'm not here. You know what I mean? Would, um, you, would you consider um, working there or is this pure? No, pleasure? never. If I'm going to Ibiza, I'm fucking never working again. It's like, that's it. That's the, that's the, I'm done. You know what I mean? I'm just going to get, well, I'm saying I'm going to get fat. I already am fat, but I'm going to get fat and brown, grow some like dodgy haircut and a beard or something. And, do you reckon you could get your tan to a stage where you're just using pure Wagyu fat? Oh, I mean, yeah, I'm not. I fucking, I'm using pure Wagyu fat from the beginning. I ain't, <laughs> there's no other choice. There's no Nivea involved, right? I'm going for it. <laughs> you know I mean? I'm going to get the boy shipping it out of the fridge. I'm going to be aging my own Wagyu fat just for a beta. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> you're going to smell so good on the beach. <laughs> I'm going to be going fucking mental when it's coming through. <laughs> oh hang on um sorry i know that we're uh, we're going on in circles a little bit here but i want to change my favorite gareth story Is it true no, no, no eh? i'm still trying to think I'm, i had one in my mind but then i completely forgot no, it's just it's just a sentence but it's um i think it's one of the funniest things i've ever heard and um guys <laughs> we were talking about crisps and um and how delicious they are really and um with that there's like Loads of varieties, and uh, and um, we were just talking about what's class. And Gaz said to me, he said, "Oh, fucking onion ring, chef. Onion rings, I yeah, uh, <laughs> I absolutely adore my onion rings." He said, "Our last goes mad at me because I just leave onion rings everywhere." <laughs> uh, he said, "I've even got them put, and this is my favourite part." Gaz went through a stage of putting onion rings above the shower head and wedging them in. <laughs> so, he, so he could eat his onion rings while he's in the shower, but so his crisps don't get wet. <laughs> I love that. I love that idea of like just dipping above that little monkey. Having his own... <laughs> Good story. Or the shower head. And, and getting him in quick before like the steam gets part of it or turning the shower head. You'll beat the shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever eaten crisps in the shower. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 70%, 70% there. 70% there. What, yeah. um, what changes would you like to make or additions would you like to make? Do you see yourself... Um, being someone build, with more than one venue. Yeah, we're going to build a pub. Oh, I mean, and and what about um, you know, I'm not begging, but location. Are you thinking relatively local to where you're at now? Actually, straight outside of my window, I'm looking out now. Oh, you're going to build it? Yeah, well, we've got a shed, an old shed, which is just sat there doing fuck all. So yeah. Amelia's an architect, right? Yeah, she's all over it. Yeah, so she's we try. We've got planning permission in for it and everything. We're just waiting for that to come back. That's exciting. So it's all designed, sort of. With uh, food, I'm guessing. Food, yeah. Just like pop up food in it. Yeah, yeah. Pies. Oh, pie, like all day Sunday rolls. You know, one of my things, like one of my biggest dreams is like you go, like you as a chef, you wake up on a Sunday, you your day off. Like you, you'll probably miss breakfast because you'll get up late. Obviously, when you've got kids, it's a different matter. But... And then, like, you get to about three o'clock and you're like, I'd fucking kill a Sunday roast right now. But then you ring up somewhere and you're like, you got Sunday roast. You're like, yeah, we've stopped at half two. 
Like, fuck. And then there's the other ones one uh, I want to do Sunday roast from like 12 till 9 o'clock at night. Yes. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you can get up, you have a, we'll do whatever you want to do in the afternoon and I want to eat Sunday roast whenever I want to eat Sunday roast, not when you want me to eat it. Imagine going for a Sunday roast at like 6 o'clock at night and having a few beers. Yeah, Isn't that's it? glorious though. Well, well, I'm going to all day Sunday roast on a Sunday, nothing else, just keep it simple. And then just like pub classics in it. You know what I mean? Like, just fucking what people want to eat and drink. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I, I always it. think there's a there's a weird thing with Sunday roast in that um, it is a delicious thing, and I need to be open about like the amount of cooking I do on a Sunday. I yeah. keep it to an absolute bare minimum. Yeah, um, because I I think there's got to be like a return on investment. Yeah, fucking, like things have got to be worth your while. Definitely. And, um, like making a Sunday, there's just you know there's me and my son, sometimes my girlfriend. And it's never really a party bigger than three. Yeah. Um, so, like, I'll buy nice meat, but then I don't make Yorkshire puddings. Yeah. I don't I make roast potatoes. Unbelievable, isn't it? Waitrose do the lot. I don't make gravy. I buy it. Yeah. And uh, I'll buy, like, one or maybe two veg and mashed potato. That's it. And I reckon I knock out my Sunday lunch with about 10 minutes work. Hey, I've got... Do you know what? I'm 100% with you on that. Me and, like, obviously, well before lockdown, obviously, wasn't there? Was <laughs> I had um, I did. I went to see Peter from Cast Me Pete Sanchez. Oh yeah, yeah. There was obviously, two families. There was uh, the six of us in total, and Peter turned up. <laughs> we, were, we were fine because we weren't in, like it was completely fine. It was a uh, league all all above board. Um, and Peter turned up like he was like, "Do you want some lunch?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah fuck it, let's do it." And he turned up with loads of bags from like Mark Spencer's and that. We're like Yorkshire puddings, roasties, fucking all pre cooked veg, everything. Pre cooked gravy a lot. And I was kind of thinking, all right, okay. And then Peter was supposed to be cooking us in lunch, but then just give up after two minutes. So I thought, fuck it. If I want some lunch, I've got to cook it. Make it yeah. <laughs> and it happened in about 30 seconds and it was unbelievable. And That's I hate it because you haven't cooked it. And when you're cooking a full Sunday lunch, you've eaten it all before you've even got there. So when you sit down with the plate in front of you, you're like, I don't want this. I've already fucking eaten it like six times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, when it's all pre cooked, yeah, when it's all pre-cooked, you haven't eaten any of it. I feel so much better listening to you two say that because that is my Sunday lunch. Because yeah. <laughs> I can there's only three of me, like three of us. I cannot be bothered to start making everything from scratch. Don't, yeah, don't get me wrong. Like if I had like a house full, then I would, you know, I love cooking. I would enjoy taking like pleasure in that. But there's got to be a moment where you think, right, okay, I want to put minimum effort in for maximum return. Yeah. And, um, if I'm, like, cooking for two, three hours, to then sit down and I will hoover a Sunday roast in about five minutes. Yeah, me too. Like, it's gone. Like yeah, when I'm in the house and I'm cooking for the kids and that, I empty pot noodles into pans and then dice Wagyu beef through it. And... <laughs> 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 I'm fucking ramen in there, look at that. I mean, you've got Wagyu in here. You know, it's a fucking pot noodle. <laughs> <laughs> right, um... <laughs> Michael, I'd like you to ask you a question about the influence, because um, you start kind of started to touch on it when we did a, a little intro earlier about whether you know Gareth sees his influence outside of a, outside of his restaurant. The, the thing is, I think it's um, it's a very difficult thing to to say something that is positive about yourself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Very very difficult to comment on without uh, because the fear of what of people thinking what a twat this guy is. Mm. So I'm going to help you out and say that. I personally see this thing. We spoke about it earlier, but I see uh, the impact of your cooking and your style of cooking. Um, and I think that style of cooking, Gaz, is based exclusively off the idea of that's fucking delicious. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, um, you, I know that you do the odd kebab here and there, but for the same reason I would eat a kebab is the same reason you cook everything. Like, it's... it's <laughs> pure kind of like and i mean this is a positive thing it's pure like gluttony isn't it? it's like fucking hell that'd be class to eat that with that yeah that would be unbelievable and and the direction that you've took with that is causing ripples people are not only speaking about it but then injecting that into yeah. their cooking as well and yeah. my question for you was one is that something that you're aware of that you've seen happening and two how do you feel about it how does it make you feel um obviously you do see it that style coming around it's, you've just got to be true to yourself, haven't you? Like, and that's the way I feel. Like, I, we are one hundred percent true to ourselves in the inner sea and what we do here. Like, 
like you say, the food comes from me just going, fucking hell, that's awesome. I want it. That's unbelievable. Like, I'll go to a restaurant or something and have like a dirty char siu pork, and I'll be like, I'm doing that when I get home because I want to eat that every day for the rest of my life. You know, <laughs> I'm cooking in my own restaurant. There's no reason why I can't. <laughs> You know what I mean? And that's how that's how our food comes by. Our food, so there's no pretentiousness or ponciness or anything about it. You know, like, it's pure filth. On the food style being, um, let's say, duplicated, shall we, Gareth? Yeah. On, the, on the food side being, like, duplicated, do you feel that puts an onus on you to to do something new? Or um, is it just a positive thing, a pride of, like, oh, nice one, that's come out? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, it doesn't it doesn't bother me in the, in the slightest. It's um, a negative got- Bother it, it, like it being duplicated or anything like that. It's like we are who we are. We're in a sea here, and and as long as in a sea is fucking flying, I don't care really. You know, obviously, I've got friends in the industry and stuff like that, like like you and all this. I hope you, like who I'm watching and their restaurants are fucking amazing. But apart from that, like I'm hundred percent concentrated on what's going on in a sea here, and and that is what all that really I care about. You know, it's like I'm having fun. You know what I mean? We're doing what we do, and that's. That's all I give a fuck about, really. <laughs> so, like, but seeing it, like, other people doing stuff, it's amazing. Like, it is flattering when you see somebody or you get people asking you how you do this. Or it is, it's quite flattering. But surely it's like, it's like we, I cook because I love fucking cooking food. You know what I mean? And like, I love eat, I love eating food as you, as you can tell. You know, but um, it's that love for food, isn't it? When other people like feel the same, it's a buzz, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like when me and you talk about food like me and you have some epic conversations about food and like me when me and you were together you, it's just a, it's just a fucking love for food and yeah. i think you said it once to me um about how like some people just don't love it and you can tell me yeah. conversation once and it's just like you can tell they just don't love food they just cook in because they think they have to or to job doing it as a sport i think that's when um cooking becomes a sport yeah and it's like they don't like if you ask them to cook a sunday roast they'd be fucked yeah yeah 100 conversation once you know and like a question like that, i've i've asked a few people like and there's a i think there might there's a lot of chefs need to sit down and, and look at what they're doing and and ask themselves a question would you eat or would you sit down and eat your own menu because i cook like the food that our menu my menu is for me not for the customer it's a menu that I want to sit down and eat. It's like I want to sit down and eat every single one of them. <laughs> and I'd eat it over and over and over again because it's the food I want to eat. I'm not cooking it for anybody else. You know what I mean? I'm cooking it for me. But how many chefs would sit down and eat their own menu? And if it's like, if you, oh, I don't know, I'd pass on that a little bit. And like, well, why, why are you cooking it then? Yeah. So you know what I mean? Like, it's that you should have that 100% love for what you're cooking, isn't it? Shouldn't be doing it because you think, oh, that's going to get me a second star in the Michelin Guide, or you know, this is going to get that, or this is going to do that. You, you, you eat it and you cook it because you think, fuck me, that's delicious. As soon as you bring that up, um, let's have a discussion about that. If we, if we can, just quickly, Cara, if we're okay for time. <laughs> you, you can go as long as you want, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh... You don't have to edit it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so Michelin, Gareth. Obviously, it does exist. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean this is a negative or, or a, a positive particularly. Um, I'm very grateful for, for having a star. Yeah. Um, and it's not something I ever really anticipated or aimed for. The year we got it in particular, it was like, holy shit, as if that happened. Um, and that was cool because it's something I'd grown up as a young chef, like, oh my God, that's got a Michelin star. It's got two Michelin stars, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, I've never worked in a three star, only two. Mm. And, um, but it was something that like, I remember thinking that's a massive, you know, a massive achievement. However, um, you know, when, when you then have that badge on you, which is undeniable, I feel personally that I'm then entered into a competition that I never wanted to be in. Yeah. And this isn't something that's the fault of Michelin at all. No, created by us. Yeah. It's, it's hundred percent created by us, but it then exists. And, um, and, you know, don't get me wrong, like two Michelin stars would be phenomenal. But then you think, well, what then? And I, I, I don't want to name any names, but I've, I've seen it happen where achievements have been made. And I think that must be a massive anticlimax. Yeah. Because now what? Yeah. Now you've woke up and the world's the same. Mm. Um, so with, with Michelin, um, there are parameters. There's, there's certain things that, that boxes that need to be ticked, whether you're trying to do that or not. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? There's some people that you can see, you can look at a restaurant and you go, oh my God, you are gunning for that. Yeah. Like gunning for that. And I think it's fair to say that you and I have never really done that. There's um, 100% of formula. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah, there if is. Right? People is blue in the face. There's not a formula. There is a formula. Well, there, there, there has to be some way of judging everything. Yeah. Um, and how do you, how do you manage your, your own self-worth alongside that competition that you didn't enter yourself in? Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you deal with that from a, you know, for, for me, um, as two star, if whatever the formula is, if it's worth a special journey, Jesus Christ, it's like, it's worth saying that in the same year, I ate at Noma and Inesia, and it was easier for me to get to Noma than it was to get to Inesia. Yeah. <laughs> Genuinely. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> I live close to an airport. I flew from Leeds, Bradford. It's like an hour flight. <laughs> Copenhagen's like, you're right there anyway. Yeah. I reckon like if they did it on, oh my God, this would be such a good Top Gear episode. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> In terms of going to Inesia, which is a busy, popular restaurant in the UK, fucking hell, that's a special journey. That's a hell of a journey. Yeah. I didn't use any tires when I flew to Copenhagen. No, no. You weren't tired. <laughs> you have a few beers. <laughs> yeah. So, like, yeah, so you're now in this competition, and I, I firmly believe that Inesia, in my opinion, is a, a two Michelin star restaurant. How do you cope with with that kind of? I guess is it is disappointment. It's okay to say disappointment, isn't it? Of course it is. I mean, you, like you never think about it until it actually comes around. Yeah, and it's there, and then everyone starts sending you text messages and going, "Oh, it's definitely your year this year. You're going to do that. and then you kind of get caught up in it because you can't help it because that's what happens because you're a chef and you love what you do, and you have respect for the Michelin Guide because of like you've said, everything you've said is exactly how I feel because we all feel the same way. So you've for the last 11 months, I haven't even thought about it. I've just got on my job. And then that week it comes. <laughs> and then you watch it and then you're like, right, okay, let's go back to work. <laughs> you know, and it's like, it is, it's a, I'm, a, I'm so proud to have a Michelin star. I always wanted one, you know, like, but it doesn't affect me. You know, I do, I do feel personally and that the Michelin guide needs to change. I think it's stuck in a I think it's completely stuck in time and I think they need to like the the food scene is changing dramatically dramatically you know and I think they need to see outside the box there's no like you said there's a formula and they're not looking outside of that formula I think it needs some youth I think it needs a bit of injection of youth into the actual system because I'm I'm not taking anything away from them and if they watch this they can agree or disagree it's just my opinion you know what I mean I'm freedom of speech and all that like they're all old yeah, you know what I mean, and they've all, it's they're all used to classic food or whatever, you know. And you and you look at the restaurants that achieve, and you think, yeah, okay. Unless you get the really, really like, like El Bulle for fuck's sake, they didn't yeah. know what to do with that place. No yeah. one did. When when the Fat Duck got three stars, everyone was just like, well, how the fuck do we judge this? Mm. You've never seen it before. So if we've never seen it before, we've got to give it either give it fuck all. Or everything. It would be a laughing stock because everyone's like, this is the best food I've ever eaten in my life. Or give it everything. Places like that, that really stand out, like that are like inventing food. You know, these guys are inventing techniques. That's a diff whole different class. Yeah. But that middle ground of like the, the restaurants that are still using classic techniques, but doing something completely different with it or, you know, thinking for themselves but they're not at that stage of like fucking Ferran Adrian, you know what I mean? There's, there's got to be something done about that. What about Norma? That yeah. restaurant has done so much for gastronomy, way, way more than El Bulli did. Yeah, because... but this is the thing, if you stuck tablecloths on El Bulli, and on Norma, do you think you'd get three stars? I have no idea. Regardless, like your gran, right, as much as she loves you, would sit in your restaurant and probably have a fucking heart failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you took a tablecloth over the table and it, she might not die. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like I'm not even. I'm just. It's, it's the tablecloth things. Bye bye. But like, if Norma wasn't so Norma, it would it get its third star? Yes. Yeah, which is which is where I think when you say about moving on, that's where it. The more true to yourself, you can yeah. be. Really... But Rene is never going to change because he's Rene and he does his own thing. Yeah. And that's fucking amazing. I'd rather be that person. I would rather be Gareth Ward with one star. I mean, I, if I lose my star, I lose my star. I'm not going to fucking cry about it, you know. 
but I'd rather be Gareth Ward one star for the rest of my life and do what I want to do and walk out of my fucking house every day, come home, eat a bag of fucking onion rings, watch some shit on TV and go to bed. Then you'd be Gareth Ward that's got three stars, that's doing something he doesn't fucking believe in just because he wanted three stars. Couldn't give a fuck. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's that's the way I look at it. And that's the way, like like what I said before, would you eat your own menu? Would you sit down and eat your menu? How many of the two and three star chefs would sit down and eat their own menu? Or would they go to McDonald's because they prefer the food? Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing, isn't it? With a one star. I mean, take a restaurant like Barafina in its day. When Niv yeah. is there. Like, unbelievable restaurant, delicious tasting food, yeah. but a million miles away from, from other one stars yeah. in terms of, like, the style, the seating plan, and things like that. And then you've yeah. oh, John, John Williams at the Ritz. Yeah. Arafina had a star when the Ritz didn't. Yeah. That is insane. Cara and I had a conversation um, off camera before, before we called. We were both of the agreement that the Ritz is a, an unbelievable restaurant. Yeah. Uh, and John's like an incredible chef. And I think if that restaurant isn't a three Michelin star restaurant, yeah. and in fairness actually goes against the, the tablecloth argument completely. Yeah, it does, but guess what? He's from fucking South Shields. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't never getting fucking three stars, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, uh, he's not French. No, he's very much not French. <laughs> uh, but his, his, his food's incredibly French. Yeah, it is. I've just food. Um, it's Unbelievable. And I had, um, did I tell you my, my Ritz story? No. <laughs> so I went to the Ritz, December actually. I think it was December before like lockdown when London was in zone two. No, it wasn't December. Anyway, it was fucking... You could eat there. When you were yeah. allowed. <laughs> yeah, masky. But we weren't allowed in Leeds. It was just, you could yeah. go to London. So I went to London uh, with my girlfriend and like my best mate from school and his like wife-to-be a far top and we were talking at the table i mean the ritz is unbelievable the service level is unbelievable and it's so be our guest it's so flamboyant and i and the service was just phenomenal anyway we started having a conversation that i'd mentioned um the um a vagina doesn't have a word there is no word in the english dictionary to say vagina in a nice way in nice context so like if um if someone said like Oh, you've got lovely eyes, Gareth. That's yeah. fine. But but vagina. Lovely vagina, Gareth. You can't compliment a vagina because the word doesn't exist. Yeah. And like, <laughs> it gets, you know what I mean? It gets really brutal. And my personal like bottom of the pile for me is the word pussy. I despise it. It's so like oh, pussy when it comes out your mouth. It's just like oh. And if you said it as a nice thing, um, you know, nice pussy. Like oh my god, that's disgusting. Anyway, um, at the Ritz, we're having this conversation. And um, we were just laughing about it. And the guy came over and I'd, I'd said to my mate Ian, I was like, should I mention it to him? Um, and just test like the, the service levels at the Ritz. Oh God. <laughs> so I, I said to the, uh, the guys like, how are you all today? And I was like, oh, really good. I said, but the, the ladies are, are struggling a little bit. We had a big night last night and they've both got really sore pussies. Is, is there anything you could do? Um, do you have a cushion or anything like that to ease it? And he said, um, sir, I will bring you a selection. And then he went. It, honestly, I was fucking done in. I was like, oh my God, your band is so strong. Like, <laughs> so, so strong. You don't get that fucking Aldi Castle, don't you? The main, the main uh, room, you know where they have afternoon teas? And pulled out one of them giant, like, cylindrical back support cushions. Yeah. So it's about one and a half meters long. Got three of the maitre d's to help him carry it, even though he didn't need these. And they carried it to the table like a battering ram. Took it, to, <laughs> took it to Dudley and said, um, Madame, would this be suitable? And like, like, <laughs> like that. Honestly, fucking unreal. And I think that is the best service in the world. Like That's they totally cool. read me. They knew my crack. They knew I was just being daft. Yeah. They outdid me. And I think the fact that that restaurant hasn't got three Michelin stars. Yeah. I know that um, the man behind the curtain got a Michelin star. Inesia got a star before the Ritz. Yeah, it did. What the fuck? Yeah. No disrespect, yeah. Gareth. That's the fucking Ritz. Yeah, I know. Songs about it. It's crazy, isn't it? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like the um, archetype of glamour. It's archetype of finesse. Yeah. And it's not like the food was letting it down. It's yeah. like, it was fucking amazing. But there is only a few places that are giving you true hospitality. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, you want to go somewhere that you feel that relaxed. 
that you can ask the fucking waiter, have you got a cushion for my missus pussy because it's been smashed in? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Cara. Food. I love food. You, you, love you, food. you love that this is going to be the best fucking crash ever. <laughs> yeah, you were like, yes, I've fucking done it. I'll win a fucking Oscar over this bastard. The sound bites on this are just unreal. <laughs> right, I'm going to have to bring this to a close. No way, we just can't, we can do this for hours. Michael, it's a pleasure. Thank you. This is a, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, Gareth, thank you for being our first mm-hmm. guest uh, co-hosted by Michael. Um, and hope, but hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Right. Thank you both so much. Thank you. We hope you enjoy listening to Grilled as much as we enjoy recording it. If you want to catch up on past episodes, they are all available now. Just search for Grilled by the Staff Canteen, where you normally get your podcasts. And if you want to help us keep bringing you the content you love, you can contribute from as little as £1. Just head to thestaffcanteen.com to find out how. This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.